Greetings. In the name of the Most High Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, the One Lord. Shabbat Shalom, Sabbath. Keeping it holy, keeping it real, keeping it for the Lord. Amen. It's the best time to uh, communicate to the body, I found. There's just something special about a day set apart. The, the Sabbath is actually Jesus Christ. And of course, by extension, the Sabbath is the body of believers in quiet Christ, the two are one. So that there's a perpetual Sabbath that God created his creation and perfected it. And then it's at a perpetual state of rest or Sabbath, a perpetual state of holiness or Sabbath. And I find that to be uh, also amazing news because, well, that's, that's what it's all part of. Well, here it is, yet another day. So you have a series of uh, audio blogging. And uh, this is not done on that same recorder, but this is done on a uh, iPhone because I have to get used to it. As when I travel, I'm using an iPad for the uh, the uh, the King James, and I mean this telephone book I've got is marvelous for being at home and there's no substitute for an actual book but having the um, the iPad is where I could, I, I could have it on the iPhone but I don't think I could read it very well but on the iPad if it's sideways because it's a mini that I have uh, you can read it and then you can use the phone for uh, for recording and just hold it as a, as a handheld recorder and then refer to the Bible. Uh, the, the KJV I've got there now is very, very quick. And so it's, uh, it's easy to get to any scripture that you could think of. It doesn't have a really a search feature, you know, searching for a word or something. But that's not something I do during, that would take too much time during a broadcast. So here we are, and I, you know, led to cover this again. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. You shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under your soul under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. And I just wanted to make that clear because uh, you know, there's a big emphasis in the um commercialized, you know, religion that wants us to, in effect, that's Malachi 4, um, at chapter 4, 2, verse 2. So there's a, there's a, as I alluded to or talked to in the last, you know, this is a contiguous word here, it's just, it's a perpetual word. I should almost call this thing, instead of the Zephyr report, the perpetual word, because it looks like it's, kind of getting geared up to be this um, A blog, you know, audio blog, kind of audio verite, to catch the spirit when it's on rather than planning for a certain time or, you know, what's the time now? It's, uh, it's about 5.15 on a, uh, on the, uh, is it the 9th? Or it's this Saturday in February. Time has really flown. But but this idea that, you know, it's all love, baby, everything's everything, and, you know, roll over and uh, play doormat for the wicked to, to, to trample on. Absolutely refuted here in Malachi, and these verses refer to Jesus Christ and the return of Christ. Not that he necessarily, but that we necessarily uh, are the eventually to be the judge because you see, it's a, at that point, it's a perpetual Sabbath. We, be, we become Christ. In so doing, we become I am. In so doing, we are the, you know, the final arbiter. 
when I say we, I, I, I mean that as I am. And um, I mean that as not we individu- as individuals, but ultimately we as, you know, one a la John 17. And so, but unto you that fear my name, let's do the body, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, that's the son, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of, of the stall. So, furthermore, you grow up as calves of the stall now. You're going to grow up. And nothing's going to impede that. You're going, to, you're going to reach, you know, the goal that the Lord has for you. And you shall tread down the wicked. Actually, it's verse 3. Tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember you the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, uh, for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful, it's a good word there, dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the fathers of the children to their, to their the heart of the children to their fathers, uh, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And um, so this Elijah thing is uh, basically the precursor of the return, and you know, I in in saying, um, you know, no one times the trib, and saying things like, uh, you know, waiting for the rapture is going to be an exercise in futility, not to take away faith, not to take away the anticipation of the return of the Lord, because it could be at any time. I meant that outside the formula of all this, that the Lord can return at any time today. And you say, well, we haven't had that tribulation and all those things that have to happen and God can't lie in his word. And it's like, well, no, you, though, can lie in your interpretation of the word and not know it. And I've seen, look, I've seen so many earnest people coming forth uh, with a word and uh, doing due diligence, and there's just no reason not to believe them. And they were wrong. Good people, people of stature, people of uh, intense faith, um, you know, over the last, certainly in the last decade, especially over the last, say, three decades of uh, people prophesying, uh, and even five decades. And when they're wrong, um, you know, there's either this repentance and this whip me, beat me, make me rad, write bad checks kind of response, and, and um, you know, sort of like a, I don't know, you've seen them, you know, and they're, and they're, they're really sorry. And or you, the other thing you get is this uh, avoidance of the topic altogether like it never happened. In other words, like no one ever said anything. What happened to Eli? Huh? What happened to Eli? Well, sorry, Molly, I'm on my schedule, you're on your own. And I'm, right now, I'm here. And this is where I am, Molly. Get up there. Get up there. Get up there. Okay. Okay, well, Molly's going to sit with you guys now. Okay, Molly. All right. There she is. Now you can hear her. Okay. Okay. You just want to interrupt me, don't you? You want all the attention. Okay, so... Molly, enough. So, the Lord has told us that no man will time the end, but the the time when you least expect it, that's when I'll be there. And then we are told that before the great and dreadful day of the Lord... Um, that Elijah will come to to mend the hearts between the fathers and the sons, which means, you know, um, uh, children and parents. It's not necessarily masculine in that sense. Uh, Okay, so Elijah comes to mend the hearts of the body of Christ. Uh, The body of Christ makes makes straight the way for the Lord's return through the love of Christ. And... um, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, 
and you shall go forth, will arise. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise, with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. That's not the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Okay, and that also means, fathers means generations. So I will bring fidelity to the body of Christ before the, the great and dreadful day of the, of the Lord, which is also the return of Christ, but it's also the judgment of the world. And yet, look, I'm not going to play this game, Molly. Just settle down. Which is also the judgment of, of the world. And uh, it's interesting because in this we have and you shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I shall do this saith the Lord of hosts shall do this meaning but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and shall go forth and grow up the calves of the stall returning you the fathers to the children and the children of the father so the, the son of righteousness will arise. Healing. Um, okay, and that's also a picture of the return. But I mean, you know, there's this period before that of healing, turning the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, healing. And then part of the healing is, you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes. And so, you know, before, I, again, as I had discernment on or a revelation about, say, Obama being a lost child of the Lord, which I know seems impossible because the, I've, we've never seen anyone as satanic uh, and as separate. I told you to stop, stop it now. I told you to stop it. You're being used by the devil to stop me. There she goes. And it's just a, uh, she just can't settle down. It's the bright early morning, and um, I'm sitting in my living room. The windows, uh, there's like kind of like, you know, big windows that look out across the plains. And, um, it, well, I can't see anything because it's dark. The dogs go out there and chase down the coyotes and clear the property. We need... Rain, we need water, whatever. It's a, it's a harsh climate, you know, it definitely is. But it's home. No, it's home. I don't feel like home is, you know, L.A. I don't feel like home is the beaches of Southern California. I don't feel like home is uh, the ocean, as I used to. Because for me, the ocean is replaced by sound. So sound is the ocean. Sound is the modality of creation. Sound is the way to Yahweh. Sound is the way the worlds came into existence. Sound is what we will be in the end. So to me, sound production, and, and you know, I haven't even tapped the potential of the sonic realities and the, the sonic prophetic sonic uh, manifestations that the studio could yield using me as a vessel. That's going to come at another time. So the Son of Righteousness uh, arises, healing in his wings. And those that fear his name will be healed, and the healing manifests in uh, treading down the wicked. So you see, here we have to make judgments, like who is wicked and who is not. Case in point, though, about the confusion is that, um, you know, one can be wicked and be still a prodigal, and one can be wicked and be just, you know, one of Satan's own. The wheat and the tares uh, grow together because you can't separate them until the great and dreadful day of the Lord, when the Lord returns. And at that point, the, the, the tares will be exposed for all to see. Now it's kind of difficult. Because like I say, some people are, you know, posing as Satanists that are really with God, and some people are posing as uh, saints who are really with the devil. And we have no way of 
actually really 100 I mean, we could start burning people at the stake, but you see, we would be just like the Salem witch trials or the Inquisition. In other words, we'd end up burning the innocent along, you know, the wheat along with the tares. Besides that, it's, it's, this is a, the judgment of Yahweh takes care of it. We don't need to become murderers and bearing false witness in order to serve the Lord. That, of course, didn't serve the Lord. It's just such a misguided um, attempt to serve God on the one hand and then a way to put away, uh, uh, you, you know, in, through corruption, put away enemies on the other or perceived enemies, which always turn out to be the, uh, the pure hearts, right? Because the pure hearts would really be the devil. It's the conformed masses that are really with Jesus. Because Jesus wouldn't want to kill billions of people if he, he made them. Therefore, it's okay to corrupt all the kids in the churches because Jesus isn't going to kill them. So we must be right because we are the masses. When I add up, and no, I'm not contradicting myself. I'm, I'm just saying, look, that, you know, he made all these people, uh, and I don't think just to throw them away. And I think there's a mystery here about how many and what happens. But in the book of Revelation, when the hammer comes down, you're losing over 90% of the population of Earth is wiped out. That's billions, folks. That's billions. So there is a time when that happens. And, and you know, and in that case, um, the people have the rapture theory because they can't imagine, well, why would God want to just throw his own out along with, the, you know, throw the wheat out and the tares? He's going to divide the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares. He's going to get rid of the tares. And there are billions of them. And that leads people to think, oh, I'm, no, I'm just taking the, the, uh, the opposite position today. And that makes people, I'm trying to show you how they got there. And that makes people think, oh, so the remnant's only about 10% or less of the world population. And would you, would you like to know that about 10% or less, according to someone that was an expert in this field, uh, according, to 10% or, according to him, 10% or slightly less is the amount of lambs in the world. That is the amount that, um, because of their pure-hearted nature, can't conform to the world because they can't have a double mind. They just, they're just made not to. So there's about 10% that are not part of Satan's system and 90% that are, that are willfully, willingly, you know, um, emancipated or if you like, uh, the, the coming of age for them involved becoming part of the world system for the purpose of earning a, a living or whatever, the you know, career path or whatever it is. And they've just lived with it. You know, they lived with this uh, thorn in their side, especially if they belong to God and they have a thorn. But that's not this group of remnant that is no matter what and have suffered and have been killed and have been mocked and have been whatever as fools, uh, been this remnant through no fault of their own, you know. And they've been told that due to your free will choice against the world, we get to come down on you. It's like most of these people never made a choice and they wouldn't even know what you're talking about if you did bring all this stuff up. Uh, they're just the way they are. And the world has scorned them, hurt them, killed them, and they're innocent. You know, they're innocent. They don't, you know, know any better. They wouldn't even know why you're killing them. They just know that for some reason that, you know, the majority of people are against them and they're traumatized and they don't know why. That was the case of me when I was a kid. I couldn't figure out why. So that's what gets uh, our, the alternative aspects of, of Christianity. And remember, there's infiltrators, infiltrators all over that, and, and PSYOP infiltrators, and all kinds of games going on. So there's never a pure um, fellowship out there. They're all infiltrated. But, you know, the purpose of which is to, you know, ultimately eradicate all God's lambs so that there's no reason for Jesus to return. Game over. But the churches can remain just like the overground church in China is perfectly uh, visible to all, and anyone can go there and go to a church in China because they are no threat to the Chinese government and they are not persecuted in China. The same would be true of the 501c3 church in America. 
They're perfectly visible and anyone can go there and they are not to be persecuted. The other side knows full well what God's lambs means. And they understand it not to mean the churches. In fact, they try to send them there in the hopes that God's lambs will become unlambs and then conform to the world and then basically they can then become Christians. You know, and have their church and be members of their church. And form a club called their church. And then they will hate the lambs. They will hate Jesus. And they will seek to destroy the kingdom of God and help prevent it from coming in in the name of preserving their church. Exactly like the religious establishment of Jesus' day. Identical. So we're not getting away from that, from that truth. What we are getting away from is this idea that we can know how it breaks down and that we can understand the mystery of having billions of people and the Lord will take glee in killing them. Most of these women, children, people that are growing up in other religions, they never heard the word of God, they don't understand what's happening to them. Would God uh, just simply kill them all? See, do I think it's an impersonal killing. I just believe that there's earth changers and cataclysms to come that will wipe out civilization and the Bible is trying to explain it in a certain way that there's a purpose to it but there you know um, <clears throat> wheat and tares or lambs and goats die every day they die every day and, and a lot of lambs die unfairly and unjustly and they weren't raptured no and they should not have been punished because they, they were just children of God they didn't do anything wrong Yet, wheat and tares die every day, many times through unfair circumstances, or live through the world being treated horribly. Why aren't they taken out of here and raptured? Why are they made to suffer and go through this and, and, and be picked on and be mocked? Why are they being persecuted if they're just children and they don't know any better? Yeah, Satan likes to fight dirty. He never wants to give you a chance to understand what's happening to you. So you, you're confused. And then, you know, what he really wants is you to sell your soul. And then what he really wants after that is your destruction. The people that serve him, all these majority, have sown the seeds of their own destruction. And many are just not even there. Case in point, Ellen Barkin. A very good example of someone that is no, not home has made the statement, um, this is, I'm using the, her as an example, has made the statement, since it's a, a spiritual statement that she made, that we belong to Obama, like we are his property, we are his people, and he is, you know, our God. She's made that statement and wanted people to accept that, and Hollywood is starting to produce this idea that Obama is the Antichrist, or the Christ, and we need to obey him because he's more than just a, a president, that we actually belong to him, meaning our soul, be, what she's saying is she believes Obama is Lucifer because she sold her soul when she was a kid. But she believes that Obama is Satan, obviously. But that, to her, is not Satan, but her leader, her ruler, her, her God, whom she would never name by name. And that Obama is really that person. So she f has made the public statement that he owns us. Now, of course, a man can't own Ellen Barkin's soul, but... The devil could. So we belong to him, she tweeted out. And of course, people would retort, you know, the normal thing, not understanding what she was saying. They would retort, uh, no, the president works for us, we the people. Uh, we don't work for him and we're not his slaves. She wasn't saying that. She was saying, he owns us. We belong to him. That's a Luciferian statement, that's a spiritual statement, and the people missed it. It's part of the new programming to get people to accept. So given that, you say, well, Brother Z, doesn't that prove, and so many more coincidences like that and, and, and statements prove that, they, that this is, yes, this is the time of tribulation for them. This is the time of the, um, the, the horses of the apocalypse running for them. This is the time of the cataclysm, according to their sorcerers, 
for them. This is the year of the snake, the time of cataclysm for them, and the time of upheaval for them, a time of uh, surprises for them, that, that they believe this is the fulfillment of the Bible. They're going to fulfill it with their Christ. And um, they believe 100% we are in that period of tribulation, or we in the, 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 the final kingdom and the final showdown. And then Obama is the guy that, that uh, Daniel was talking about and, and, and that uh, Revelation 13 talks about and that uh, Paul talks about as the man of perdition and on and on and on. In other words, they believe it and they're going to fulfill it. Certain ones have fallen out of faith. For example, Oprah Winfrey was a big, you know, thought he was the one. And they often, often in their circles, they call him the one. And all this focus on Obama, who just soaks it up. Again, he gives nothing to anyone else but receives everything. People pledging their lives to him, not the country. Their, their lives are honor that he's the one that will take care of them no matter what country they're in. And they have no loyalty to anything. And this is what they've done. And you're seeing uh, the replay of how they sold out in secret. Now they're doing it openly and publicly to the devil, which they think is Obama. They thought it first before you did. And, um, you know, so I have no explanation of how the Lord could tell me. And, and you know, this, this idea of, of talking about Christ-likeness, of forgiveness, and of not wanting to condemn the 90%, the billions to, to death because of their disobedience to the Lord. Because you can't categorize like that because you deal with a, a, very, a lot of uneducated people and a lot of people that don't know anything about what you're talking about. So that has to remain kind of a mystery. What I was suggesting is to remain open to the possibility that um, you know, there, are, there are targeted souls to be saved. And, and you know, you, you, the only way you're going to have any discernment is to go with the Lord because the, the left-handed path of Satan and the right-handed path of the Lord, uh, you know, the body of believers most believe this is that time and this is the, um, and, and, you know, we may have the UFO thing. Every sign in the world, which I believe is leading to some sort of deception, is leading to some kind of false mock doppelganger copy of something profound in the book of Revelation and the prophecies of the Bible, but it's an, it's an imitation or fabrication for the purpose of um, some kind of mock battle of Armageddon where, you know, uh, involving, you know, aliens and the president and, and the abomination of desolation, all these being staged for the purpose of having this sort of fake Armageddon. I know this sounds weird. So, so that the Christians will believe that all this is real when this is the end times programming kicking in. because the Bible is not a comic book that would be fulfilled in that way. So, But they will do a comic book because that's what they know, how to produce movies and how to produce results in that way because, you know, Hollywood is Satan. And it's, I don't think there's anyone that... I mean, I think Ellen Barkin was, you know, almost a kind of a sign of relief that she would reveal her heart in that way. Obama owns us, she said, unequivocally, you know. Just what she's trying... She's being put out there to influence people because she is a celebrity, you know, not a very big one, but she's a celebrity, you know, that people know. Um, and to show that it's not just left-wing politics. Left-wing means Satan's politics. Right-wing means God's. No, I know right-wing is corrupted and left-wing, but I mean, in a pure form, left is Satan, right is the Lord. You know, righteousness is God, right? That's the right. And left-handed path would be, in, like in India, would be tantrism, which is, you know, satanic ritual, sex magic, sorcery, divination, all those things are on the left, whereas you have, on the, on the righteous side, you have fidelity to God, Elijah, you know, Elijah would be the embodiment of, of what, you know, man could be to God uh, before the return of the Lord. And um, uh, the other side would be Jezebel, who is at war with Elijah and sends people to kill him, but they're unable to because Elijah has Lord's protection. So there's this ongoing battle, and that we, we're never, never going to shy, we'll drop our guard from that. 
And I understand that many of you will be miserable as you go forward and as you are trying desperately to get through and feeling like persecuted every step to the point where you just can't even leave your house, you can't go on a trip, you can't have a laugh, you can't go and have a conversation at the cop. You just feel like, well, Lord, I mean, just kill me, please. Exactly. There are some of you in that. And there are some of you who are in bondage and chains in prison and grateful for your uh, new little bit bigger cell or your, uh, the fact that you can uh, have um, materials or paints to paint with and you're out of high security or you know, that, that you're so grateful to have a little more freedom. Other people have total freedom who are complaining the whole way saying, Lord, why don't you just kill me? Even though they have the freedom to move around, they're not in prison. And everything in between that My warning as of the last few days, which is what it was, the warning is we can't buy into a convenient narrative of the end, of the rapture. It's being, you know, mind control, manipulation. Look, the churches have been doing this rapture mind control thing for years to keep people glued to those seats. In other words, if you leave, you won't be raptured. I mean, that's the meme. So that was a very convenient meme for them. That's where we first encountered the rapture doctor. We just thought it was, you know, BS. When we got to these churches like John MacArthur's church and Calvary Chapel and some of these Rocky Peak and some of these other big places, and we never went to Saddleback, but, you know, they're putting forth this rapture thing. And I just can't, what did you pull that out of your ass? What's the matter with you? And, you know, it was all mind control in there. And the, the Satanists who were in the choir were staring at Trish and me with murderous intent, wanting to kill us right there. I mean, if they could, they could have busted out and just cut, our, cut, our, cut us to ribbons. And we got the message. The other stealth people said, you know, if you come back here, they're going to get a restraining order on you to make it more overt. So you know we're not just kidding. And what did we do? We went to church. What did we say? Nothing. Did we go to groups and talk to people? No, we didn't. They say, we, did we interrupt anything? No. Did we participate in the service? Yes. Were we quiet? Yes. Were we polite? Yes. Then why would they do something like that at John MacArthur's church? I, I don't know. You tell me. Why would they bar God's people from church? Isn't that what we've been talking about for the last decade? Wondering after, you know, that kind of reality? It's because the Satanists rule the church and they don't want um, God's people there because it's a p potential threat that would disrupt the uh, homeostasis or the status quo of that institution called the John MacArthur Grace Church in, in the Valley of L.A. And so he, John MacArthur, doesn't want those kind of interruptions. You know, when I used to listen to him on the radio show and people said he's a magnificent preacher, I'm like, how can you say that if that's, if that's his policy? Putting a restraining order on lambs who might come through the door. How can you say that? No, it's not lambs that come through the door. It's lambs that show an obstinance into changing and adapting to the culture we have here. <laughs> Those are people that refuse to become Stepford wives and husbands on cue as ordered. But in that MacArthur experience, we were shown that we are not welcome, even if we keep our mouths shut and behave, uh, because in the spiritual battle, John MacArthur is given over to the devil, to Satan, and has given him place. Satan owns his butt while well, he sits there all high and mighty. How many people could see that deception by going to that place? I would say, I would say hardly any, if, if any. Why was he exposed in the spirit? I don't know the history. I mean, he may be dead for all I know at this point. But why was he exposed? Because he had put on airs of being holier than thou, and the Lord brought him down. The wicked was tread upon by us in that situation, exposing it, not for the purpose of being doctrinally in error or anything. That wasn't it. It was even a more severe charge. 
the charges that he at the helm of the Grace Church enforced Satan's rules, kicking Jesus out in the name of John MacArthur, who wanted to be above and beyond the Lord. And that's the charge that he's going to stand by. That's the treading down of the wicked. He's the wicked. Who among them would ever say he belongs to the devil? And I'm not saying that's the final thing. I'm just saying, you know, the devil's got him by the you-know-whats, or Jezebel's got him by the you-know-whats. He's not free. And um, I believe God has a plan for that flock to deliver them to maybe all of them. But it doesn't start without, you know, some kind of truth. These people are going to be very uncomfortable going forward in their cushy little churches. Because, you see, the problem in America, and the reason America is at the helm of, of, of you know, someone that could potentially really destroy, is because of the, the, the helm of which is someone who could really destroy, who, who then, ironically, I would say, is uh, got one of God's lost sons, and, you know, not the devil himself, to, to, and the contrary view would be all of Hollywood and every, all the left would say, no, I'm wrong. And then certain Christians would also say, I'm wrong. So the narrative is going around, the meme. <laughs> all mind control. Huh? So I guess the Lord would have to keep you separate from that, meaning you could never say what's what and who's, you, you, you just got to go day to day. We never expected to see John MacArthur and his church sold out to the devil. We went there with, a, with an honest, open-handed approach, with, a, with an open mind, wanting to worship collectively with other believers. That's the reason we went there. And for that reason, we were dismissed. As my friend said, well, they want something more from you. It's like, well... There are certain things that are reserved for the Lord, you know. The true love, the true, true, true center, the true essence of the being of me, I give to Jesus Christ and I lay down for him. But not for man. There are certain things, my, my true love belongs to God. That's whom all my love can go to. Not to the circle of shame under the queen of the damned, in the disguise of churchianity. Whoa, whoa, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, see if you ever get invited to the barbecue. No, I wouldn't go there because, of course, my life would be in danger. So I would go to the Satan barbecue, but not the Christian. Yes, the secular rejectors of God would be, uh, I get along much better with than the true believers of Jesus. Or, I mean, who proclaim that in their structures and institutions. So the better question from yesterday goes to this. So would God destroy all the churches of America? The answer is yes, Absolutely. And he will. He will destroy them from one end of this country to the other and back again and forth. And, and, and it will keep, at the end, will keep going, keep rolling along. People say, no, it should be the seventh year now. If, uh, I don't get it. Where's the Lord? He should be. And so, well, no, the Lord delivered his people. Thank you very much. And uh, the, the wedding feast is, you, you must have missed out. It's all, I've lost my faith. It's all random. I don't know what the dates are anymore. I don't know whether this is tribulation or I'm living in hell. Well, you're living in a, in, in, you know, they've, because of your allegiance, uh, you know, to Jezebel, they have that has given permission for them to create hell on earth. And you are here to experience it. Oh, it, it was good for a while while they were recruiting. You got some trinkets, but now, of course, there's no need to pay you. The Lord can reach into all of this and bring it about. And I do believe he will cause the church to repent. And I do believe that he will um, not burden those people in the church system 
who are the pure hearts. They, you know, if you wanted your church to be sustained, you should have allowed the lambs of God to have full access. Then you would have been ensured that God would not um, destroy your, quote, your people. Just like Obama has his people, these pastors have their people. He, like he owns them, and they pledge allegiance to him. And the temptation for power is just too great, so it doesn't get ceded to Jesus. It stays with the church culture. Therefore, the irony is of ironies is that you can't have uh, <laughs> that fellowship uh, and, uh, and Jesus at the same time. At some point in your life, you're going to have to um, lay it down, you know, and, and laying it down will get you booted out of um, church. It's, it's, I don't know what else I can say about it. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm tired of the topic. Um, I, I'm, I'm tired of, uh, you know, having to repeat myself over and over again uh, since from the very beginning with no change in the message, no change in the truth, no change in the word, no change in the interpretation, no change in anything that we say here, no, no change. I would love to be wrong and say, you know, I got to repent. These people are so great and I'm just really enjoying it. How marvelous it is to be worshiping collectively and have that nice organ and choir and those festivals and all the hoopla and the, the Bible studies. And isn't that just wonderful? A good set of friends finally. And mm -hmm. That's not available to the true believers of the Lord. Now that cost you. So the Lord is going to straighten this out. Elijah comes to return. This is the, the, what Malachi is talking about is that Elijah returns to cleanse the churches because he's talking about the fathers, which means religion of the fathers, which is Yahweh, right? So when it says the the the, the children would be put with the fathers and the fathers with the children. It means a cleansing of the temple. Elijah comes to cleanse the temple, to take all these people that are, you know, proclaiming Jesus and believe they're with Jesus and give them about 99% except they hold out maybe 1% or whatever it is. The Lord's going to come in, as Elijah comes to cleanse, you know, he will break, cleanse, he will, uh, as far as how does he deal with the, the church at Thyatira? Well, the church at Thyatira is sold out to Jezebel. But the works have been good. In other words, see, a lot of these places do very good works and charities and things like that. You know, it's not, um, but, but uh, what happens is that uh, anyone who is fornicated with Jezebel knows, meaning anyone initiated into the world system, knows the depths of Satan, as I said yesterday. If you know the depths of Satan, you will be, not only will you be destroyed, but your children will be destroyed. Now, I interpret that further. It's in Revelation 2, if you like, go look it up. I interpret that further to mean unrepentedly so, knowing the depths of Satan, because I believe that you can repent of that. There is a point of no return, and, and no one can really say when a person's reached that. You can observe someone and see that they're, if you knew them since childhood, you see that they're not. Uh, this happened when I saw old schoolmates, and it was like, whatever's in that, that body is not who started out there, so they're gone, so I write them off. I, I mean, if they're not who they were, and there's not even a memory of, I don't know who it is I'm talking to, but it's not a human entity anymore. It's like an alien. And at that point, I have to move on. When the Lord shows me that, I have to move on. That is not a prodigal. That is, not, that, that is one that has gone past the point of no return. And I've seen quite a few of them in, in my time. I don't say it's the masses, but I say it, it is something that's a reality that we have to pay attention to because so many people are, you know, praying for that father or praying for that son or praying for that wayward child. And, um, but the child's not there. The child's dead. There's a, there, the vessel goes on. I've seen this soul exchange happen when I was, uh, you know, well, just let's put it this way. I've seen it done to children 
and um, intentionally, how they'll take a, uh, break a child, break his will, and then what they do is, you may call this conformity, but this is what really happens. They take another entity and put it in that child's body and, and then raise him up. So the kid that was the child flees at, say, five or six years old. He's replaced with another entity. That's the one that grows up to become senator or governor or a rock star or whatever. Um, it's hard to discern. It's hard to see. But, I mean, I, I saw that and because I, I wondered why they would break a person to the point where he was, you know, you would say mentally ill. In other words, there was just no hope. He was, he was just traumatized to the point of incoherence. And then suddenly everything was fine. He was a new person. Not for, through Jesus, but that's the devil's way, to take these disincarnate souls and stick them, you know, break a person for the purpose of extracting the soul, putting the other soul in, and uh, raising them up to be the person that lives, and dismissing the... Um, now some of these people are multiple personalities, and you can still see a shadow or a recording of who they were. But ultimately, every time, that entity comes out and takes over. So there's that, too. Such are the depths of Satan, my friends. This is the nitty-gritty truth of what it really is. Not pleasant, because Satan's always about counterfeit, so there would be counterfeit people. They, God created them, he takes the soul out, puts his, pe he puts his people in to those vessels, and then they're his. God allows it, they're called tares. But I've seen people that you would call tares that were prodigals, and people on... I've seen a lot of people in religion, in Christianity, that belong to the devil, that are those kind of people I talked about, and they're, and they're running things. Uh, and if you say anything about them, they just write you off as a quack or a kook. They just can't believe there's something wrong with their society that could be as wrong as something I would tell you. But I, if anything, I understate it because I don't, I, like I say, I, at the end of the day, I don't want anyone to suffer. I would love it if um, God would just pull the plug on this whole thing and we could all just be with the Lord and uh, get on with it and get, you know, be free of evil and free of bondage. Now, the people that are in overt bondage here are the ones who are free and the ones who seem to be libertine and free of bondage are the ones in bondage. Jesus binds us to freedom. Satan frees us to bondage. So we have a mirror worlds that are mirroring each other. And um, that's how they can see. They can see who's on the other side of the mirror from them. They're free so long as the collective proclaims themselves to be free. But at the end of the day, they are the ones in bondage. The ones who are free are the individuals that God sets free through the blood of Jesus Christ through the appropriation of that blood for the forgiveness of sin. And at that point, a person's free even if they're in prison. They may not have a physical freedom because you can't just walk around anywhere because there's persecution and stuff, right? So that, you know, the all-seeing eye sees you, you know, and they sometimes run after you. <laughs> and that's silliness on steroids. Um, the game is silliness on steroids, absolutely. The game is hilarious. The devil is to be mocked and laughed at. Um, hey, if in my near-death experiences the last couple of years, uh, had I perished in that regard, um, the, it would have been win-win for me because I would have been with the Lord. But uh, their plans all were interrupted. Now they're not here anymore. Oh, there's other things going on, you know, but I, again, I would just stress that, um, you know, in all dealings with lambs and, and with the people of God, that, that you deal honestly. But, you know, I, that never stopped them from, from, you know. It's weird because the people on, who are really serving Satan are the ones who seem the most religious and devout. You know, it's the most bizarre thing. And then the ones who, who seem satanic, like I say, where most people write them off as being uh, with the devil overtly, um, don't seem to be so. 
I mean, you know, when you look at it in the in the spirit, it's the the opposite is true. And you know, how can one say with the obvious uh, man of perdition, the obvious antichrist, Obama? How can one say with a straight face that he's a long lost child of God in the end, and they're mistaken about him being the one who, in the words of Ellen Barkin, owns them? How can that be true? And the answer is because everyone who you know worships him is deceived. Would they want to bring about a fake you know um, uh, tribulation, a fake rapture, and a fake uh, this and a fake that? You don't think they would? You don't think that um, the End Times Ethos Mind Control Program is going forward full tilt with hol- holography? holograms that are going to be coming in to convince you that there are signs and wonders from you don't think there's all that fake signs and wonders and uh, this whole deception uh, a la Hollywood that's going to try to grip uh, people and uh, lead lambs to the slaughter you don't think so well then you're underestimating the powers and principalities of wickedness they have high tech stuff that looks that to you is just magic is it would be signs and wonders They could bring fire down from heaven right now and hit anyone they want with it. You know, and, um, you you know, it's uh, the better question is how can God's people walk free through this world with all the dangers that there are out there? Now we're seeing this guy running around getting vengeance on, uh, on, uh, you know, taking out cops that are they're having the biggest manhunt in history for this one guy that's eluding them. It's almost like a movie. Well, there will be a movie about it. Uh, but he was one of theirs whom they rejected, though he was down with them and their stuff. Yes, I do liken, um, you know, political left wing with Satanism, you know, at, at, to a certain extent, because uh, all you'd have to do is look at the DNC convention when they cheered God out of the platform and then and they, 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 they had to force it back in, but the people there didn't, you know, cheered as God was. I was just imagining if Jesus was up there being crucified, the whole DNC would be cheering. You wouldn't see that on the other side. So, I mean, it's, it, hey, the facts speak for themselves. So the people that say both are equal, no, that's not true. Corruption and all, but both are not equal. If you're for individual rights and liberty, then you have a fidelity with God of some kind. You have some, you're not so far gone. If you're for cheering the crucifixion of Jesus, then you're a Satanist. What did Jesus call them? The children of the devil is what he called the people that crucified him, ultimately. And the rest of them, they were just caught up in ignorance. He said, they were ignorant. Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then there's another way to look at that statement, like, yeah, Lord, they know not what they do, therefore we win. <laughs> Knowing that, you know, they, they, they just defeated their own devil, their own, you know, and the bulk of the world will worship the beast. Okay, so, yes, so in that case, God would get rid of them. I'm just saying that the Lord Jesus is, is look, the tendency is to write off 99.9% of the people as fit for the fire. And maybe you're right about that. But the problem becomes, you know, we are to be ambassadors of, a, of the better way. God can reach into any heart and change it. If we're not praying for those that we consider to be on Satan's side, you know, and, and some are, you know, admittedly not home, okay, and, and, and may, may not be returning, But still, we have to have a pure heart about this. If we condemn them now, and I'm not saying that, you know, it it would be necessarily wrong, uh, then it makes God into an idiot that created this whole world and all these people just to throw them away, which would make him seem, in a way, evil. You say everyone has a chance, but how many people know the Lord, know the gospel to be real? Most people have written it off as being false. Unless the Lord shows us something, shows the world something, there will be less and less believers. Something supernatural must happen to encourage the, the real hearts for the Lord to come forward. Right now, it, the, the thing that has to be it would be Elijah. 
um, you know, the Bible talks about this great harvest. In every generation, they believe they're the generation of the great harvest, believing that the world couldn't get possibly more evil than it is right now. Okay. So I couldn't work it out yesterday, but the way I have to work it out is we go forward not proclaiming ourselves to be know-it-alls and not proclaiming ourselves to be, you know, we trod down the wicked and wickedness. That's exactly what I've done with the churches. Now, I have not played God in this. I have simply witnessed what I have seen and what I have experienced at the hands of the church system. You know, because judgment and cleansing begins in the house of the Lord. You're proclaiming Jesus, and yet you, you, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a church of Jezebel, which I guess most would be, and, um, you know, and, and you're doing the good works of Jesus, and, and it's this sort of mixed bag, the Lord said he would not come down on those people that do not know the depths of Satan. He will give them a pass. So if there are any of his in these places, they get a pass. But if they uh, work for Jezebel, if they've known the depths of Satan, no, the word no always means, you know, uh, everything from sexual initiation to, to, and, and anything else that goes, uh, physical initiation, physical, um, uh, uh, physical allegiance, if you will. So if they've known the depths of Satan, then obviously um, not only they will be killed, but their children will be killed. Doesn't matter what, if they're pastors or, you know, uh, in the choir or, you know, or ushers, it doesn't matter what they are. If they've known the depths of Satan and they're faking it, then they're obviously prodigals of the devil and they don't belong there. They're corrupting, they're trying to corrupt the body. You think Jezebel would tolerate someone in, in her church not knowing the depths of Satan? Do you think Jezebel is working so that all people would know the depths of Satan, so therefore it's win, 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 win. You don't think that uh, Jezebel's policy would be to corrupt in the form of conform all the children of God to know the depths of the devil and agree with it, and that that is the purpose of the Jezebel church. But Jesus said if they don't know the depths, then you know obviously that proves they are mine, and there's cosmological, you know, of a, a cosmic proof in that sense, meaning universal proof. Therefore, obviously, I will not harm them. I will deliver them in Revelation 18, come out of her, so that you're not, uh, so that the plagues to be visited upon the Jezebel church, or if you like, the, uh, you know, the Babylon church, and the queen of Babylon, mystery Babylon, uh, would be, would uh, not be visited upon you, so you must come out of these institutions of uh, that only seek to do one thing, mind control, and convert everyone to the Jezebel way while touting Jesus, um, that you are, if you belong to the Lord, that you will come out and be separate, be, you know, and unfortunately, well, yeah, the Lone Ranger Christian, uh-huh, they're like, they're better, no. No, no one said Lone Ranger. The, the people of God are all connected in one body, in one church. There is no separate um, uh, from, separation from the body of Christ. Not height nor depth nor uh, any other power can separate us from the love of God. You know that darn well. So through the love of God, we are one, a la John 17. We are one and we are more cohesive than any collective organization that would call itself church or a club or this or that or whatever. We are the body of Christ upon the earth and we are all brothers and sisters and uh, we know it and we are one and we are many. I mean, not, you know, it's a remnant, but, but many, you know, compared to what the world might think. So this confrontation between the world of Satan and, um, and God is coming to a head. Let me contradict what I said yesterday. The end can come any day. I want to I make a radical statement. I want to go even further beyond yesterday. The end of this entire thing could come any day without delay. It'd be perfectly scriptural. Meaning the end of the tribulation time could come at any time. The plagues and the horrors of the book of Revelation could suddenly coalesce and complete 
within a very short period of time, exacerbating the end of the whole enchilada, and it could happen over the next year. Without vi- and it would go against all the timetables. And the people that are to be with the Lord will be with him one way or the other. Many throughout the ages, talk about the, rap- the real rapture, it's called translation. Many throughout the ages have been translated not only to be with the Lord, but translated, as some of us have, um, locationally, to be in one place but then another, to be in one dimension but then another, and translated to the Lord without seeing depth, death, and it's not just Elijah and Enoch. But it's a reality. So the Lord does pull his own out and it moves him, to, moves him dimensionally out of harm's way as well. And that's what all the angels have the power to do because they're interdimensional themselves. Okay, so, and they can take people out of one and put them in another track of reality is a mystery, you know. There's all these tracks of, of, of existence uh, and yet there's the one. We're only aware of one. But there's any number of possibilities. All things are possible with God. That's the fulfillment of that prophecy right there. Including um, alteration of time, space, and the changing of dimensions for the benefit of the children of God. Amen. So that, so that God's people, folks, and you may not be aware of this, are being raptured, if, if you like, even in the most structural sense, um, on a daily basis globally. And the children of God uh, don't necessarily all know the Bible or, you know, the church culture or any of that. Children of God everywhere. um, You know, these are the people whose hearts are what what they are. They're the same heart that you have. You know, whether they're in one culture or a Christian culture or, you know, or whatever they are. It doesn't matter where they are. And that will upset so many people who feel they've towed the line. The real upsetting thing is Matthew 7, uh, 21, 22, 23. Lord, haven't we done all these things in your name? This is a picture of the church system today, which Jesus would rail against if you were here. And and those people would be, you know, the Lord would say, I don't know who you are, you're out of here. And they say, but we healed, we prayed, we gave charity contributions, we had missions, we uh, we printed Bibles, we did all these works. Uh, thank you very much, but I don't know. He, technically, legally, you, you have to be, you can't know the depths of Satan. You have to know the depths of God. You know, you, you've made a choice there. Did you think that all your good deeds would then make up for what you are became? Mr. Nimrod, Nimrod Christian Church, um, why did you do that? And to a greater extent, um, Nimrod Society, Nimrod Babylon, Washington, Nimrod uh, 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 Military Industrial Complex. You know, what's all this, you know, lauding uh, of, of, of uh, the troops on the one hand and then having them commit suicide on the other? I mean, that's, you know, no, no one of, no godly person would ever have something like that happen. That's, you know, that d- d- demeans and sullies and besmirches the uh, reputation of a military that's God-fearing and shows a military that's uh, the upside-down pentangle. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the Medal of Honor. That's the highest medal you can give a military person. An upside-down pentagram in the Baphomet pose. Oh, well, gee. Isn't that nice? But no worries, Washington is already apotheosized in his Baphomet pose in Washington, D.C., along with all the other horrors. That's the truth, you know. That's the truth. Can God clean it up? Yes, he can. Can God, does God like the principles of the Constitution involving the Creator? Yes, he does. But does God hate the corruption that's come in? Yes, he does, but the corruption's normal. It comes into all institutions. They can be set up for God and be righteous in the beginning and then they get corrupted and and overthrown in the end. It's been the way of the world and the the rise and fall of civilizations from time immemorial. Nothing new under the sun. This is old news. So how then do we live? There's the good question. 
we live open-handedly. The Lord wants me to give the other guy the benefit of the doubt, not being an expert in, you know, discerning every spirit all the time and not just being cynical about it and saying, well, it all sucks, I'm waiting. For... Look, you, all of you who are saying it all sucks, I'm waiting for the Lord, you're not going to be satisfied. You're going to be in the, in the Beckett uh, atheist uh, Beckett play called Waiting for Godot where he mocked God. Waiting for Godot is a play where, where these people are waiting for Godot, which is a, which a, which is you know a play on the word God, Godot, G O D O T, and Godot never shows up. <laughs> so it was a mocking of those people waiting to be raptured, obviously, waiting for the Lord. The Lord never showed up. Now, what are you waiting for externally? Jesus said it in Luke seventeen twenty one, the kingdom's within you. But what do you say before? He said, "Don't look over here. Don't look over there." Don't keep looking, 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 looking outside yourselves for the kingdom is within you, i.e. you have God, Emmanuel is with you. You know, it's with you, it's with you, it's with you. The kingdom is eternal and the kingdom is inside you and the kingdom is with you and God is with you. You are with God. You are, the, the wedding feast has taken place. It's already happened, part of the mystery. It is going to happen. And it, you know, people want this dense 3D terms, but the real reality is within us, not what we see externally. Where are all these spiritual beings? Well, they're within, aren't they? They're within the, they're accessible through, you know, people meditate and they, they shut their eyes to go to, uh, to see, to be able to see where these entities are, what the world, the real world looks like. The fake world, this external world that we are now convinced is the real world, isn't really the real world of the new Jerusalem. It's not the new world, the real world of, of, um, the, the, the dimensional universes. It's not the, the it's not the real world of how creation comes and goes. It's not the real world of the world of the of the throne of God. It's an external world that is fallible as we look at it and try to make discerning statements about it. We we are you know we're wrong a lot of the time because we have uh, incomplete information. That is only one dimension out of how many millions of configurations. All we see is this one thing which is um, uh, almost like, in a sense, a, a, you know, some kid's erector set that he's changing all the time, and we think it's real a la the Truman Show. And, you know, but here the good news is, because it's not completely real, we don't have to take it as seriously as we have been doing, thus giving us a, a more happy um, stead. I... Um, I tend to like to look at little things, you know, in nature, you know, clouds and trees and different things and, and, you know, say, well, look, this is our lot for now, you know, and this is good because I have the Lord and I'm walking with the Lord and I'm inquiring of the Lord as to, and he's informing me as to what's going on. And rather than wanting out of here or to go back and relive time and, you know, be younger so I can do it better and all those things or beating myself up and lamenting what I could have, would have, should have done and didn't. And beating myself up and saying, but Lord, it, you know, it's the rejection's killing me or whatever. You know, it's not pleasant, but to understand all of it in the context of the Lord's will, that he's in control and that there's so much I, I don't know, but I need him to guide me through because this is a world that is not reliable. Therefore, I'm at peace because I have my Lord to guide me. And when people are doing things or I suspect people of doing things, the Lord always calms me and says, I'll take care of it. You can't do better than that. The Lord will take care of it. The Lord will make a way where there is no way, and he'll make sure that uh, you know, you're being dealt with in a good way and that there's no hidden traumas. And if there have been hidden traumas where you've been betrayed and blackmailed, or not blackmailed, but betrayed and set up and false witness and you know, stolen from and lied to, that the Lord will rectify those things so long as we... Uh, you know, we give our, you know, unless he's using it to break you, but, you know, if we give our heart and souls to him, inquiring him, him all the time, proclaiming him and as, as the, the, the arbiter of our walk and the, the one who um, looks over and can see everyone and everything that is, that is impacting upon us, um, then obviously um, we're relying on him in that regard, not ourselves. And that is the, that is the recipe for peace. I rely on God. I have to deal with people honestly, you know, and um, I've got to account for my behavior. And, and at the same time, 
you know, I'm dealing open-handedly because my Lord is seeing if there's some, some deception there or something that's going to bite me. So my discernment is to yield to him for what to do in each situation. And sometimes it's just like, you know, it's more pleasant for me to deal openly and honestly um, without being cynical that everyone and everything is out to screw you. My grandfather taught me that everyone and everything, and, and my father too, everything and everyone out there is there to screw you. That was their philosophy. And they're both miserable. So I don't want to deal like that. I don't want to be a cynical old man. I want to be an old man of childlike wonder. You know, and, and thrilled with, with new things and thrilled with nature and thrilled with God's creation and thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. And yet rolling up my sleeves when there's sadness and brokenness and hurt along the way that where people need, a, you know, help. To, to, to do that, I, have, I had to, you know, forgive our church experiences as just us being naive. We, did, we didn't know that for thousands of years, you know, all the institutions were corrupted. We, we saw it in the Bible, but we didn't know that it extended to, um, you know, institutions called church. We didn't understand that. And we didn't understand how the populations therein could be mind-controlled. But now, of course, I see the whole nation mind-controlled, so I'm like, okay, then that's not such... I had to forgive all that. I, that it's got nothing to do with me. You know, in a sense, I'm just kind of like a, a traveler that's passing through. And, you know, and I'm observing and I'm just not taking it personally. You know, these people at the, the you know, at the church and in the choir that wanted, you know, to, to just with murderous intent stared at me and Trish, you know, th that's sad for them. But, you know, we're just passing through. We were no threat to them. But they just wanted to make sure we didn't, you know, pitch our tent there. Within them is the spirit that knew that we might upset the apple cart by causing repentance or something. You know, I, I don't know. But again, it's not me versus them. I, I give them, in other words, I accept that they're acting the way they should act. The church system, no, Eli, you stay here now. You stay here. The church system, the system of, uh, uh, of the fallen humanity and all of that, uh, the lying and, and cheating in Washington, which now is affecting, it's, it's disturbing a lot of people, isn't it? That you elect a representative and they go there and they, they turn to the other side and they, they represent the, the side that you're against and they turn turncoat on you. I understand that's disturbing to watch, is it not? But now you're seeing that you need God to have your back or else that sort of thing happens. But the people that adopt an attitude, friends, now when you hear this, that sound is me on a, uh, it's a vape, uh, an electronic uh, e-cigarette of uh, water vapor. And it might be just a nervous uh, thing, but no, it's not, not harmful to, to humans. I think smoking could be potentially harmful with tobacco products, but... Uh, I notice no ill effects with, with the vape uh, situation. Um, my lungs are more clear than they've been in 15 years. So now I'm not saying that caused it. I'm just saying, you know, that's just the state of health that, that I find myself in, which I'm delighted and, and amazed, you know. And hopefully it will, you know, so many things have been kind of writing themselves. I'm like, okay. So we're, you know, as like Kel's song, uh, restoration. We're experiencing a restoration. I don't know about you, but um, I believe this is the time of the restoring of God's people, and it is perfectly aligned with Malachi four three. The verse we began with is what we're experiencing. Or verse four two. I'm conf you know I'm I'm too lazy to go look at it. verse four two and four three um, because. As soon as there's restoration, there's the trotting down of the wicked. I'm like, how do we do that? Let me explain the trotting down of the wicked. We don't make judgments that we just go forth and happen to trot down the wicked without even knowing that we're doing it with intentionally ma or, or malice. You know, it's not son of thunder time. It's just that our existence and our walk 
And our restoration via Elijah is itself trotting down the wicked. And that's the secret to that, to that verse. Your existence in Christ equals trotting down the wicked without you having to become hateful in your heart. Amen. No, I don't want to dwell on, on, you know, the temporary leader Obama as being, you know, I mean, this was their, you know, their best shot at their new age Christ. And that's what they really, you know, are are trying to, you know, and he wants to be there because he likes the power. And, you know, the whole thing is dwindling at this point. And it's, you know, it's just, it's a sad thing. But if, if there is somebody like that that's there, let me, let me explain why there may be evidence that he is not one of them. First of all, He's not with them, and he doesn't meet with them, and he doesn't hang out with people. He's separate. He's accepting their worship and devotion, but he isn't them. That's one thing that um, is clear, that he is separate from them. And if you look at him uh, through a mirror image on the other side, on, say, God's side, he would be, uh, you know, uh, quite a different fellow, you know, quite quite a change. There's nothing impossible with God, and uh, Eli, I told you, I'm not letting you out there. It's really simple. And Molly's barking out there, so Eli wants to go out and, uh, you know, and join in in the fun. Because I just, I'm, I'm in the middle of this word and I can't really move right now. This is all audio verite, so you get little, you know, it's not going to be this formalized studio thing, but it may be at some point in the future because we, we will be doing more interviews and, we don't know. The future is kind of open, and, and right now we're, we're kind of in this period. But as far as the institution of church and the body of believers that is caught up in the wheat and the tares and all that, the Lord will straighten it all out. I don't have to get involved because my ministry is not basically the churches. My ministry may have been you know, pulling people out of, let's say, destructive situations or dangerous situations that appeared to be one thing, but really were something else. And, um, you know, and, and, and to give people hope that, hey, the Lord can heal you, you know, and, and this idea that people go to a, as many people as possible to pray over them, you don't need that. Eli, well, then she's, someone else is going to have to do it. Okay. So, um, do I have to worry about the churches? No. Uh, you know, they are seeing the result of their prayers because they've been praying for the, for the, uh, for, for the, uh, the prosperity of the United States, for the sustenance of the United States, for the lack of war, for the, for, the, uh, for the good things for the United States. They've been praying all this time. And the evidence is, uh, as a corporate body of various, I don't know, this seems irrelevant, this idea of denominations. That seems to me to be right there in apostasy, you know, that there would be denominations would be a proof of failure in my view. But they've all been praying and, um, you know, uh, we've been praying for the truth to come out. They've been praying for the, uh, for the Band-Aid fix. Well, the Band-Aid fi- the, their prayer was all answered, no, we will not give you the Band-Aid fix. We will expose you, says the Lord. Uh, but the truth being exposed about the, this nation, this world, the situation, on steroids coming out, our prayers were answered. Theirs were negated. I rest my case. Do I believe that they could all be redeemed? Yeah, I, I believe there's a ton of people on, um, you know, um, that, that are, that are uh, you know, believe they're with Jezebel or slaves, or, you know, God can free the chains of anyone. I don't care how dark it is. I ran into some a brother the other day. He'd been a, a pimp and in, I don't know, whether it's the porn industry or something, and he was completely delivered from all that. Um, and uh, I've, people with, with drugs, people with, with infirmities, I've seen all kinds of things. But again, not by our will, but by his, not because we demanded a certain time, because of his timing, we, we believe that he could do anything. And that I have had, for example, I've had to accept thorns in my side and dangers, which only made me stronger toward him. Relying more on him 
because I had no other place to go. And then as I did that, I got received a healing too, but not on my schedule, not the way I envisioned it, not the way I wanted to limit him because had I, he given me what I wanted when I wanted it. He'd be firmly in a box locked up with a lock and key. Thank you very much. That's not what we need. We need our God as if we could lock God who's in everything and all things and created all things as if we could put him in a box. Our egos are, are wicked in that way. So, you know, I want to show forth Christ to, to the world and I want to show, you know, be open-handed and, and giving the other guy the benefit of the doubt no matter who I encounter along the way and not, and if it goes to, you know, pointing fingers and if it gets down to that conflict that happens so often, so be it. You know, or it just gets to an impasse, right? In other words, you can see there's just frustration in the air and tension and then pretty soon people start manifesting. Okay, if it gets to that point where they start manifesting, their demons start coming out and yelling at us, then we break fellowship at that point. No one needs to explain it to me. I understand what happened. Yeah. But at the same time, I want to see as many people at peace as possible. I know that we can't get to peace simply by looking the other way or putting on rose-colored glasses. Again, the institution of religion has been trying to do that uh, for centuries, and they have failed miserably. The Lord wants us to show love to our enemies and so we may know someone is on or has temporarily chosen. So you can't really choose Satan in the end. This is where I think there's a secret. You can't because it's not a choice. <laughs> and you can't sell your soul because it's not really yours to sell ultimately. And yet we see people that aren't here. So we see that, you know, and I understand. Now, when it says burn in the lake of fire and brimstone forever and ever, if you're in the new Jerusalem, is there a fire and brimstone? The answer is no, there is not. Is there a punishment for wickedness? Yes, there is. The universe is very clear. God made the universe and God's will is very clear in the universe that, you know, you do bad things, bad things happen. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. That's my concern for Obama with these drone strikes and personal lists and personal animus and, and invective... Uh, uh, you know, manifestation to, um, you know, take out enemies in a personal way. Uh, to me, um, I mean, is it, is it David and Goliath? Is it David slaying the Philistines with the drones? Or is it personal animus? You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. But is it, in other words, is it live by the sword, die by the sword? Or is it a, a, a corporate collective, you know, slaying of enemies that would be hostile toward, you know, the people of the nation? Uh, you, you know, that's a good question. That's a, it's a concern. And, and my prayer is that Obama would do the right thing, that Obama would be a good leader, and that he would, it, that he would good, be good for the people, and that whatever it is that I'm perceiving, you know, if, if he does belong to the Lord, that my, my prayer is constantly... That uh, that he be restored to his uh, to his true place where he belongs, and um, you know, and so, boy, oh boy, I'm you know what I'm doing. I'm believing. Not only do I believe, but I believe my prayer will be answered, and I believe that you, the listener, will witness the impossible. And it, I don't know how. I just know that with God, all things are possible. And no, he doesn't give me you know, Bill Clinton or other political leaders. It's, it's him. There's all this religious fervor and, and religion around. And then when there's religion around, then yours truly gets involved. That's when I kind of interface with it. Just like when Ellen Barkin made the statement that rose to indicate a religion and a slavery of Satan and whatnot, he owns us um, at that point. I got involved. I've seen, they, she, did, she had many tweets about how evil Republicans are and how they should all be killed or whatever it is. But this statement was different and that's why I mentioned it. If they mock God alone or mock people with Bibles, that doesn't bother me too much. It's, it's when it gets to the, this assertion in a way that he is her God, that he is indwelt, 
And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of like... And, and the other thing is, not only does Ellen Barker believe that, but the breakaway church of alternative Christianity that's largely involved in conspiracy theory and lots of things like that, they all believe that Obama is the man of perdition and the Antichrist and that the rapture is imminent. And um, I hope they're right. You know, I certainly, you know, don't, don't expect anyone to um, think that what I'm saying is a popular message uh, or anyone to just sign on and go, yep, bro, see, I just love this idea that it's, we just can't tell when, when that's going to happen and we don't know if that rapture thing is a real thing or not and gosh, we don't know if this is the final end but it feels pretty evil and, and now uh, my, my, my sacred cow, Obama, he's supposed to be the AC. That gives me comfort to know that the Lord's return is imminent. Now that's even in question. I'm not going to listen to you anymore because that's not the kind of thing that I want to deal in. At the same time, I got brothers out there, and I'm sorry if I haven't written back enough or whatever, but you guys out there are talking about cosmological changes, supernatural changes leading to different kinds of consciousness upon the earth where people will miss the movement of God. And other people thought that there were angels involved in uh, turning the lights out on half the, um, uh, the, the audience at the uh, Super Bowl. And, you know, that the opposite kind of thing happened where the other team was then energized. And, and I'm, I'm saying, you know, is that a sign? Is that a wonder? Is, that a, is it a mystery? You know, yes, it's a mystery. But in terms of sign and wonder... Um, you know, I, I'm not sure it rises to that level as far as symbolic sign and wonder. You can look at it and go, okay, that was something. But if, if you know, it, it, angels turned off the power to send a message. Um, you also had the uh, the kind of voodoo-like possession of Beyonce, which if you take some of the footage there where her eyes are twitching real fast and you slow that down, you'll see the entity that possessed her. So we do, did see... Um, spiritual possession of Beyonce and, and supernatural strength as a result. And then we also saw the lights go out, which on their side, they think, well, Beyonce's power was so strong, it short-circuited the lights. And uh, because a lot of times these people, if they put a watch on, the watch stops. If they walk by lights, the lights go out, you know. There, there are people that, that have that on them. It's not of their making. It's, that, it's what is inhabiting them. Beyonce is in a, in a position of great power, and uh, so she would be used by the strongest spirits to uh, put forth her message to influence people to go the way she's gone and her genius husband. So you could be geniuses like them. And, um, you know, and in the end, all these people, you know, let's take Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston did the best national anthem of anybody in history. And um, Whitney Houston belonged to the Lord. And Whitney Houston got all involved in drugs and, and you know, became, you know, uh, she was part of the Hollywood scene and you know, she was a celebrity. She had a tragic death, okay? She couldn't quite kick, you know, she had troubles. But anyway, she went with the Lord. That's her first love. That's who she belonged to. I've seen a lot of people say, well, too bad she went to hell. She didn't quite make it. And I'm here to say, you don't know that. That would be a false statement. The Lord since then, of course, showed me that she went on to be with him. So, you know, those of you worrying about Whitney Houston, your worries are over. I'm not showing this all the time, but in her case, yes. As a contrast to others, um, you know, uh, interestingly enough, I, I don't think anyone doubted um, that she was uh, belonged to God, really, that she was really... Uh, so there's an example of wheat and tares. Well, a lot of people thought she was just a satanic whore. A sellout. Well, she sold out in one sense, but her heart never did. And probably that's where she ran into her troubles because she was not all the way in. And uh, she went with the Lord. So, you know, so I guess there's a lot of hope for a lot of people then. But if you think she went to hell, I think you'd, you'd be wrong. And uh, I believe you're wrong. And uh, not only that, um, if that were the standard, then you will go to hell too. 
and so will I, and so will everybody on earth. And I cannot say that Beyonce is going to go to hell because she's got like voodoo-like demons in her dancing. If you look at voodoo rituals and look at what she was doing, you'll see a similar possession. It's very similar. A lot of those people, they're caught between the devil and God. You know, it's, it's a struggle. So I don't know. I can't, I can't say anything about Beyonce and where she's headed or Jay-Z or you know, rock and roll artist or you know what happened to Jim Morrison. I don't know. I don't know. And I know a lot. I've inquired. Some people, the Lord showed me Whitney Houston, but he's not going to show me everyone. I'm not God. It's not my position. I think Whitney Houston and her outcome should give people, I mean, if you believe me, which you may not, but I believe that that, that would give people, I can see a lot of things, but what I can't see, he can fill in, but he can't fill in everything because I'm just a human at this point. <laughs> in, temporarily at this point. Whitney Houston, um, I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that she, uh, when she sung, you know, about God and when she sung her heart, I don't think, you know, you, you know, so that's, hey, it's not my opinion, it's a revelation, you know what I mean? My opinion would probably be like yours. Well, she went with the devil and that's too bad, you know, let's not do the same thing. People look at the external behavior and the drugs and everything, they go, oh, that means she's going to go to hell. No, no, it didn't mean she was going to go to hell. All you drug addicts out there, um, don't be afraid of the Lord. You, you, you know, why don't you just be a drug addict and come to him as a drug addict rather than running away from him until you get straight. Look, I've done that, and that was a big mistake. You know, the Lord takes all of us the way we are. Hookers, criminals, drug addicts, you know, uh, tend to be the best saints. <laughs> Why? I don't know. <laughs> Reprobate presidents. <laughs> rock stars. Um, yeah, because a lot of rock stars were groomed to be what they are, and they, they, when they wake up, suddenly they get whacked. What, what about that 27-year thing of, you know, Amy Winehouse, uh, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin. What's this 27 thing? And who were these people? What about, uh, you know, Kurt Cobain, Lane Staley, and all these other tragic, you know, stories? They all seem to be a little weird to me, you know. Um, uh, and they all seem to be a certain kind of spirit. Like Jimi Hendrix could sing Voodoo Child and have this kind of like uh, almost omnipotent thing. He, he had a kind of a similar thing to Obama, a similar spirit. It's weird, you, you know. Uh, what I mean by that is he was separate. He wasn't part of the music community. He wasn't part of, um, you know, uh, Eric Clapton's little group in England, you know, his little bevy of his salon. He wasn't part of, uh, you know, the, the, he always stood apart. And I kind of look for people that stand apart, and then I realize, oh, okay, because I can then see, you know, and then he was wondering about the aliens and his music, and he was, you know, he, he was proclaiming himself voodoo child, and that song was filled with satanic power. And you could feel it, and you could feel powerful if you listen to it. I'm sure many a soldiers put that on in the helicopter when they're going by and gunning down the whole village or whatever they're going to shoot. They put on Voodoo Child full speed, and the machine guns go, or now, now it would be death metal, right? Put on death metal, fire up the guns, and go. Um, music very important. But as he progressed, he talked about angels that visited him, he talked about, you know, um, you know, he moved away from the voodoo child thing. And, uh, but anyway, he was uh, inconvenient to be in this world. I don't think he was just killed because he, uh, you know, oh, no, no, these people are all murdered. They're not suicides. But I don't think he was killed uh, for money. Like in the case of Michael Jackson, it may have been a money motive, you know. I don't think he was killed for that um, at the time. I, I just think it was... Uh, I think that, you know, this is, this is what I've thought for a long time, that, that he would have uh, proclaimed God and he would have, he would have repented. He, would, he was on his way to truth, let's just put it that way. And that was just, you know, but he had been the industry and the whole thing is satanic. So he 
was on his way out of Babylon, and so they clipped him. Oh, no, he's roasting in hell, bro, Z. You don't know that. You don't know that. I happen to feel a kinship with Jimi Hendrix. You know? And uh, why is that? An affinity. I certainly, um, you know, uh, I, that, that was the biggest influence on me musically in the world, especially his drummer, Mitch Mitchell. He completely opened my eyes to what drums could be. And uh, he's he's gone now too, God rest his soul. But, you know, there there was nobody that, drum, that brought this kind of intense jazz, like rock drumming. No one ever seen anything like that before or since. And it was very powerful. And then, you know, he got confused too later on when they did a movie called Rainbow Bridge and, and, and poor Mitch Mitchell was trying to adapt to playing double bass drums. And he just, it was just, you know, of course, compared to metal today would be pathetic. And it was just, it, that was just the wrong thing. And then there was a resurgence back uh, later on, a lot Trent Reznor and some other people back to that single bass drum and a different kind of music. In other words, instead of, no, don't get me wrong. I like metal a lot. I like double bass drum when it's done right. Um, but there was a confusion there. There was there was all kinds of things going on with music, you know. Again, the wheat and the tares, you know, you can't say, uh, yesterday I spent my time uh, listening to a few songs by a, a metal band that uh, uh, was, was a Christian band, and they were having a dialectic going back and forth between the devil and God. And the, the one voice of, the, of uh, and also of fallen believers that the Lord was trying to rescue and the dialectic of you know, I'm trying to help you and then you're running away from me and but I'm a monster, why would you want to help me? And so there was this like pure voice kind of singing about, you know, one thing and then there was this metal kind of, you know, that metal yell that, that is it's, it, it almost you know, hard to even comprehend at times. And then double bass drum and guitars and stuff. And then, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, I thought someone was submitting this band to me to to produce, you know, a an album. And the first thing I would do is I would really get uh, the mix on the guitars and the melody and the the whole thing. Uh, I would I would approach it differently than than what they did with their previous album. I saw a lot of areas where I could help, but you know, it also also looked like they had a management and everything else. But I would I would um, keep on with their theme and their dialectic, and I would just develop the. Uh, the style a little more, get it a little more sophisticated in terms of uh, music and um, um, and really, you know, the, the sky would be the limit if I could, you know, they're all in the 20-something, so a lot of energy, right? The sky would be the limit if I could have a band like that and really develop it and have the resources to, to do it. But uh, uh, yeah, this would be music that would definitely pull people out of the fire. That's one thing that struck me. It was just really great and um you know a listener sent me the uh, link the links because he heard that i was interested in doing a metal project well a metal project the way i would approach it and i'm switching gears here so let's okay that's the end of the the rima i i hate the rima i mean i i, I love it but i hate the division okay i hate the division between us churches, lambs, this, that, the other thing, all these divisions. I hate it all. I hate the situation of division. I want to love and be loved and, and have good regard to my fellow man. I, I just can't take it. I, I, I just hate the fact that there's this arb arbitrary, artificial division so we can't be friends because of some thing that's not us in the way, but we would be friends given if this was a different world. You you think I like that? I hate it. That's the end of that word, though. Now we're on to this music thing. Gotten good response on Sword and Dove. What a you know. Listen to the interview. You can hear some choice cuts there. Uh, get the CD. Uh, you know, go to the link and get the CD. Uh, that's an order. You support. In, I don't ask you to do a lot of stuff. I'm asking you to do this. A lot of you have. There's you know several hundred dollars in the account now. Uh, at, at, uh, in our Reverb Nation account, thank you very much, but it's not enough. It's not enough. You need the album. You need to buy five of them and give them out to, uh, you know, people. Or, or you can, you know, when it's on iTunes, you can get download cards and things. But 
you need to support it because it's the idea of its existence is almost impossible. And look, what more do you want out of out of mixing and mastering than that? You want you you know I've compared it already to every, just everything out there. I'm like, what more do you need? And I also felt that the, uh, <laughs> of course, I might feel this. My ears are very sensitive right now, so I also felt that the the, the band that I heard, although I couldn't hear it on super fidelity, I just felt that um, you know the, the the stereo image and so there's some things that I could do that would bring a um, a much uh, clearer sound, you know, to them. And uh, mastering obviously is uh, it's not just a matter of turning it everything up all the way you know, and, and, and making it radio ready and having all the volume up. It's not just a matter of that. You still need dynamics. And I believe that the sort of dub album, even though it's a completely different kind of music, you, you've, you've got dynamics all the way. You've got shades and shades of sound and shades of character. You've got character changes all the way through as per the song deserves with about the same volume level. And uh, good stereo imaging, you know, good... Uh, Use of uh, of uh, pans and in you know and and and, and the, the stereo field. What I noticed with Megadeth, especially in in um, the two thousand nine album, um, uh, oh, oh, what's the name of that? Um, End Game. I should know that End Game because I did a song called End of Game, uh, which has one of the best mixes in metal. You know, completely blows away most everything. Well, there's a technique that they use to get the sound they're getting and it's 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 stereo separation so uh let's say they've got a um you know the rhythm guitar there's there's you know two guitars bass and and double bass drum is megadeth so you have the the heavy rhythm guitars going okay and you've got kind of a uh uh you know a, a distortion bass going and uh that's more in the middle but the way that they do with the guitars even acoustic guitar is to blow it out to the sides. You've got, you've got uh, part of the guitar is on one side and part is on the other. They're not identical mirror images. And uh, that's leaving room in the middle for vocals, drums, and bass. Then the uh, leads, when they come in, when it's just like a lead, bass, everyone playing the same notes, those are still pushed out to the side, those leads, and then the bass is more in the middle. There's enough separation in there so that uh, Dave Mustaine's you know vocal gets just above uh, the music, and then they they uh, roll off the bass on it to make sure it's got a spot, but that the music can be as powerful as as possible. And, the, and the, you know they they're a band that always you know every song they'll take off and do lead solos and try to kind of outdo the one they did before, and then those can take their center stage in the middle, kind of where the vocals are, and then go back out to the sides. But I've never heard in any other record guitars pushed to the sides in that way. And so they come into the stereo field when you listen to it on earphones, but they don't come into the middle. They're still out, but they're balanced on each side. But it's not the same on each side, even though it's the same rhythm, same chords. There's a different, there's different effects on each side to make it sound a little different. There's like a slight delay, and there's a technique they're using. I can't, I'm, look, this is just from cursory listening. Uh, that technique should be used on every metal band there is. It's not hard to do, because a lot of times it gets a little bit muddy in the middle because they're not using those sides. Megadeth figured a way out to make everything pristine in their mixes by using the sides properly for the heavy rhythm, leaving all kinds of room for finesse and, and leads and vocals, and, and, and even doing it with acoustic, when it's just the acoustic guitar before the big bass and drum and, and lead comes in. The acoustic guitar is also pushed out there, so when the vocal comes in, it's in the middle, and the the single guitar is pushed out to each side, but with a different kind of effect and treatment, or, or even a different microphone. Having you know, or you know, when you record acoustic guitar, you have a, a direct plug in. That's one track. You have a microphone. That's another. You might have an ambient mic. You could record the same performance with three mics, push various information out to the side, get it out of the middle. And it becomes more powerful, and the whole mix becomes very clear, despite all kinds of insane volumes going on. And that leaves a lot of room for the punchy drums and double bass to come through. Uh, double bass shouldn't just be sixteenth note, you know, um, drive. 
at times you have to hit do actual 30 second note rolls using drum and double bass and as a finesse thing and then it's got to be broken up it can't just be da 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 da, da like that it's got to be you know you know all kinds of different sorts of things with the drums that are accenting what's going on with the guitars it just can't be a uniform thing uh, again well, I think Megadeth is a, a great command of the studio and mixing that um, leaves it very clear it's very pure you know um, in the sense that the same exact thing could be rendered at a concert you know not overly produced stuff and so they stick to that they stick to those fundamentals and you know that's why they're probably the most successful of, of all of them. Um, they may not be my favorite in terms of, you know, there may be better drummers and better guitar players, and, you know, I'm sure there are. It's, the envelope keeps getting pushed. You know, the new youth coming up today, the, uh, the next generation, will take metal to another area. I just think that because of the dramatic nature and storytelling ability in metal and narrative that can be created that I just believe that uh, in terms of getting into the stories of the Bible and the conflicts in the Bible, that it could, it's really powerful when it goes, when it, because it can incorporate Satan screaming his head off and then God coming in and thwarting him. And that's, it, it just reminds me of like high drama of a comic book or a WWE wrestling. Not, I, I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a mocking way. I mean that in a good way. Uh, high drama uh, movies about um, like you know the uh, good versus evil and things like that. I think those themes are handled in metal better than anything else. But I just think that you know some bands have tried to exploit it by bringing in symphonic elements, which also heighten the the dramatic the dramatic aspect. I'm not sure that's a good idea. I remember there were bands like uh, Symphony X and you know various people. That, that did that, which I which had a high level of musicianship, dream theater with progressive metal and different people. You know, I've tried, but but the biblical epic and the epic struggle of the spiritual battle, I believe metal's ultimate home is going to be in Christ, in right? Not with Satan as where it kind of began, you know, this idea of lifting up Satan or whatever. Uh, I believe that's a that's a non non starter. I think the ultimate place for high drama is the say the bible is the conflict of the spiritual conflict and jesus christ the blood of christ and the whole story of the passion of 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 christ and everything lends itself to extreme high volume intense music and uh so i don't know i don't think metal's done yet i think it's got you know it's i think it's just finding its spiritual uh roots and so away go the, the bands like, uh, you know, the Korns and the Metallicas and various, you know, all these other kind of alternative metal and, and, and prog metal and tech metal and various other things. I think all of them, including, you know, prog people like Tool and others, it all has to, the narrative has to, it, you know, singing about Satan and the new way to live and all that stuff is just, that dog won't hunt, baby, you know? It's not going to hunt. It just... That's not the big con this conflict. Is the soul, man? So that's my thing, and I'm, you know, no, I'm, I, I don't know what, what what project I'll get involved with, but I think you know I'm I'm looking at one now that's kind of a kind of a Trent Reznorish blend of of you know metal elements and synth and big synth with a single bass drum uh, and with alternative drums and and with a kind of a a little bit of a cinematic feel. And, you know, I'm looking at that as, a, as, as an interim, but one day I'll do a pure metal thing. And, and I'm, you know, a lot of prophecy can be revealed. A lot of scripture quotes could be put in there as well. Choruses that are really clean against a guy, you know, really screaming. I mean, you've, the light and dark versus dark and light, you know, great. And I think in a lot of ways, the Sword and Dove album, which was just pure, almost, from another dimension to me. It was just it was the most amazing project. Uh, I think th that, it, that it hit on so many levels that it was so sweet and so nice and, and, and at times, but then there was an edge to it at, at other times. And I just think it's maybe more accessible than, say, metal would be. More people would like it because of, the, 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 of Kelly's writing, because her writing was really um, commercial in a way. In other words... Not commercial sellout, but commercial meaning that, you know, these melodies, you can, you know, go right to the heart. 
I can't listen to it all the way through without crying about eight times. Part of some of that might be being subjective and and having a bias to it, but I it just I I get overwhelmed, and I know that I've talked to other people who have just heard it as a CD. They've been overwhelmed. I don't know. It's got that thing in it that just puts you into that mode. You've got to buy it and heavily, and you've got to distribute it. You have to distribute it out there to people, because I I think. And if I'm right, then, then, then you're going to whip yourself if you don't. It produces uh, worship. It produces a, a, a breakdown. It comes at you and it, it just, it's just, it produces a, a some sort of effect of, of having you, you know, broken to your knees. And even though it, it, it's got little light songs like Infinity and, and, uh, and some fun stuff, it's, it's heavy too, you know, it's sword and dove, it's two opposites. And it's uh, sublime and subtle and, you know, it sneaks up on... Even the most hardened, cynical person, put that on, they'll start crying. If they give it a chance, unless, unless it's in the background somewhere. But if they give it a chance, they'll, they'll, they'll break down crying. A grown men cry at this record. I don't know other records where that happens too often. No, it's not crying in a bad way. It's crying because you're overwhelmed in the spirit, because you're, the Holy Spirit's on it. And how many records have that? And when I'm in the presence of the Holy Spirit, I start crying, don't you? It's overwhelming, isn't it? It's like, I just want to lay it all down and just give it all up and just let go, and I start crying. And then, of course, I want to be taken away by the Lord. Of course, I love a a, a, a rapture, but there's no collective rapture. What can I do? I didn't invent the rules. Um, but what my my hope and wish would be would be you know a lot of humanity at peace and with no more pain and struggle and all these psychopathic wars, you know, and starvation where there's where so that there's a plenty and even cannibalism where there's plenty. I I look to me this is hell. You know why? Because hell is even worse. Instead of a lake of fire and brimstone, you have all this beauty around, and then it's and then the evil. That contrast between the beauty and the horror of humanity, to me, is hell, is more hell than being just in fire and brimstone. It's more horrific. That, despite having everything, we allow our fellow man to be destroyed thinking it's because of lack. I mean, it's the most insane thing. I mean, it's the most insane thing that we do. Um, that because some men want power, they will subjugate an entire people into slavery and even start killing them. Or one tribe over here goes after another one, or one gang goes after another one, even though they're all similar, they just start killing each other. To me, that's more horrific. Happening here on Earth makes it more horrific than a lake of fire. To me, that's anticlimactic. Here, it's ultra-tragic because of the abundance and the potential for freedom. Like when I showed that priest I told you about, and I, and I, you know, I, at that time, my family had a beach house. We were in La Jolla on the beach looking out over the ocean. And I... And he, was, he got it stuck into the bar and got the gin, and he was slamming the gin. As I was telling him, you know, look at all the abundance in the sea. Look how much there is. Plenty for everybody. And he got so mad. He goes, a man still has to make a living. In other words, what he was telling me is, a man still has to be a slave, even though there's abundance. Man will not let other men be free. It was this. I well, it made the perfect sense that he had to. He, as soon as he found a bottle of gin anywhere, he would slam it with that kind of attitude. You know, how ha- sad and tragic is it that the whole sea has enough abundance to feed everybody on Earth, and yet you're not allowed to go out there and fish. You can't have a farm. You can't ply a trade unless you get permission from Jezebel. A man still has to make a living, meaning 
a man still has to bow down to Jezebel. I just find that to be intolerable. And the saddest thing in the world, you know, I mean, that dictators would starve their people to get allegiance from them and allow cannibalism in the streets like Stalin did. I, I, and that he's just one man, that if the people had banded together, they could have gotten rid of him, but they just allowed themselves to be subjected and killed and tortured. And thank God they're not being tortured anymore. They're gone. But how awful. We complain about Tyson chicken, putting these chickens in these cages and mistreating them and harvesting them. Well, what the heck's going on with the humans? It's the same level. To see all this potential for peace and harmony and to see leaders like Obama and like everyone before, he's just like Clinton and Bush and they're all the same. I mean, I wonder if the, the, the quote left that doesn't like war, if that, I wonder if they'll ever wake up to realize this is potentially the biggest warmonger in history. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how much of their own principles they have to sell out uh, in order to... Uh, to tolerate their leader, you know, which is you know, basically free abortion, late term the best, no war, and no God. And then they have to put up with him with the Bible and quoting scripture and, you know, uh, it, the world's really messed up. And, and, and like I say, the effect I'd like to have on people, if possible, is to bring them to a state of peace harmony and an intense in childlike interest in anything that would interest them. They'd be excited about life and excited about, you know, and, and being able to live with giving the other guy the benefit of the doubt rather than going around just wondering who's going to screw you next and, you know, and being traumatized out because the world is evil. You know, I think we, the ch children of God, need to be an example and to rise above that to make it attractive to be a child of God. If they could just see how you could, you know, uh, despite the circumstances, because of the love of God, you know, emanate that love rather than emanating suspicion and paranoia. I just don't think that, I think that's a horrible way to live. And I'm going to get off now. <laughs> You've got a blog, blog, blog of audio verite. Uh, those of you musicians and the metal and whatnot, yeah, I'm working on something now that looks like it's going to become... Uh, another record I'm looking in a way to become kind of a, like a label producer. There's some things that are going to happen, but uh, first I'm going to take off out of here. My daughter's coming and, and I just have to take time with her to like we did last year to, uh, you know, we, we may uh, broadcast from the road, let's say. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, when I've been around the new age spirits, um, you know, there's definitely a hostility there, even though I'm showing love, they're showing hostility. And then they're saying, you're hateful, even though I'm loving them. And I'm like, how can you call my love hate? When I give you good regard, and I'm not judging you for your new agedness, I'm, I'm just wanting to, you know, I don't understand. But then I realized by calling the other guy hatred, you know, and by calling your predatory practice love, like love and light of new ageism, but hating everyone who doesn't see it your way. <laughs> okay, I'll see you next time. God bless.